My name is Jens Jeppesen. I'm with uh, the Center for Democracy and Technology. We're supporting the, uh, the conference here. Um, very happy to be here and to chair this debate. Uh, as the description of the panel says, uh, uh, the Data Retention Directive is really the most controversial piece of legislation involving privacy and security in Europe. And to say that these issues are topical right now is an understatement. Um, and uh, as you know, in the wake of, of the Paris attacks, there is now increasing pressure for, uh, for new uh, European rules uh, from several uh, governments. And so it's clear that this issue is going to be high on the agenda uh, in the coming months. Um, so to say that it is, it is a timely debate is, is another understatement. So let's get to it. We have a lot to cover and uh, limited time, and uh, we want to use it well. So very quick round of introductions of a, of a very impressive panel of, of experts. First of all, Sylvain uh, Metil is our moderator. He will make sure we cover all the angles. Uh, he's head of technology and privacy at uh, BCCC Attorneys uh, at Law in Switzerland, uh, where he focuses on data protection issues in IT, lectures at uh, uh, computer crime uh, at, at the University of Lausanne, and wrote a PhD about government surveillance, uh, among other things. Fanny Hidechvi, I am probably bastardizing that name, I'm sorry, uh, from Hungary. Uh, she's worked for the Hung Hungarian Competition uh, Authority in the private sector, and she's now head of the Data Protection and Freedom of Information Program of the Hungarian uh, Civil Liberties Union, uh, HCLU, in Budapest. And from Holland, uh, uh, Fulko uh, Blockheis, a partner with the law firm uh, Bugs, where he is specialized in media law and IPR and other things. He uh, also, aside from the client work, he uh, writes uh, articles for the press, gives lectures, um, and is a guest lecturer at the University of Leiden and a member of the Dutch Copyright Association uh, and the Dutch Advertising Law Association. Welcome, Fulko. Also from Holland, uh, Rehos Zenger is a privacy advocate uh, from the well-known uh, uh, digital civil rights uh, group, Bits of Freedom. Uh, he is um, working uh, on various uh, civil rights and digital communications issues and has worked uh, 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 intensively on the uh, Dutch uh, legislation on data retention uh, and the challenge to that. Um, Francisca Boehm. Um, is a, an assistant professor of uh, IT law at the University of Münster, and she teaches IT law, IP law, data protection, and media law. She studied law in Germany and uh, France and has a uh, PhD from the University of Luxembourg. Um, she did a, uh, a PhD on uh, information sharing and data protection in the area of freedom, security, and justice, and, uh, and that uh, uh, thesis was uh, published as a book by Springer in 2012, and she's also co-written a paper on the topic of, the exact topic of this debate uh, uh, from, for the uh, Parliament Green Party in June of 2014. And uh, uh, Hilke Heimans is uh, head of unit at the EDPS. He is uh, currently on sabbatical to write a thesis on the role of independent regulators in enforcing protection of European constitutional values on the internet. And he formerly worked for uh, an advocate general at the CJEU, and before that as a counselor with the Dutch Ministry of Justice. So, uh, uh, a lot of expertise on the panel, uh, so let's get to it. Uh, Sylvain. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for getting up so early in the morning and filling up this room. We were not expecting so many people, so we were a little scary that we will be almost just between ourselves, but thank you for coming. So, Ilke, I'll let you start. You have the floors. Thank you. <coughs> it's always a pleasure to be here at the CBDP. I feel a sort of veteran. I remember it before. It was not even here in, in Skarbeek, but we did it somewhere else in Brussels, so this is really always a fantastic event which takes place every year and it's nice to be. I also feel a bit a veteran in terms of data retention because I followed this file since 2005, which is I think almost 10 years ago. I remember that data retention directive was finally adopted very quickly after the London bombings of the underground. And I remember also one of the first things there was that there was enormous push to get this 
data retention directive done to get it through the political process through parliament and through council. Uh, it was particularly the result of this terrorist attack that time that made it urgent to act. At least that was the, that was the uh, ratio why this data retention directive was adopted and why it was also never thought of what the implications of fundamental rights were. I remember one of the famous sentences in the European Parliament just after the bombings that the uh, Minister of the Interior of the United Kingdom came to the Libe Committee and told them that it's good to talk about fundamental rights, but the only real important fundamental rights is the right to go to work without getting bombed. That was the start of a whole debate in a, in a totally different context. And yeah, there might be some ideas that this context changed again now. A lot has changed since then. Since then. Uh, the <coughs> directive has been challenged before the court, initially because of its legal basis, and then finally, we all know, because of its substance. Uh, it's also good to remind you that the directive was that time uh, adopted in a time when there was not yet the charter as a basis, as a, as a binding instrument, which made it easier to adopt measures which intruded uh, fundamental rights than it is now. So there is a change from then to now. And this, I think that's a good red thread we could take when we look at this case, that there is now, thanks to this clear guidance given by the Court of Justice, there is a framework to, to look at when new measures are proposed that require uh, surveillance, retention, or whatever, in any case, intrusions on rights to privacy and data protection. The red threat. <coughs> that brings me to the judgment itself. I only have very limited time, so I do it very, very quickly. Um, there is a few things which spring to mind. The one thing is, and that's for lawyers in this area, the most, important, the most highly relevant point is that the Article 7 and 8 of the Charter, so the rights of privacy and data protection, are more or less taken together by the court, not as, not as different fundamental rights, but yeah, just as one package of fundamental rights. There's a lot to say about it, but it's, from a legal perspective, quite interesting. Um, then, the second point to make is the seriousness of the intrusion on the fundamental rights. That's something where the court is quite strong. They say this is particularly serious. It, it, the, what happens through this data retention directive, the retention of traffic data, it allows uh, conclusions on exactly on privacy issues, on, uh, on precise, it allows precise conclusions on the private life of citizens, and not only of a few citizens, no, of all citizens. So that's the, the, the nature of this intrusion was a very important um, uh, yardstick for the court to finally decide on uh, the way it did, namely by st striking down the directive. The court said, in, especially said that feeling could, people could have the feeling that they were under constant surveillance, and that's very important for them in their decision. And as I said, all people. Uh, that brings me to the legal test. What the court does, it does a very uh, scholarly legal test, by starting by saying that the essence of the rights to privacy and data protection are not uh, touched. Uh, one can debate whether that is a sensitive way of dealing, but that's the way they dealt with it in any case. They also said at a certain moment that privacy was not touched because the content of the of uh, telephone calls, of communications, is not part of the retention directive. Uh, then, from the essence, it goes to, it explains that the purpose of the retention made sense. There is a, there is a general interest. There is a general interest to fight, uh, fight <coughs> serious crime. So, that, there, there's no point at that. But then, the main issue for the court was the proportionality test. A strict proportionality test. That's what the court did. And that's really quite interesting, the way that is really a very strict test they imposed on this case. And when you look at that test, some questions arise. Uh, basically, they started with saying that the, the 
the instrument of blanket retention, as they call it, as it's quite often called, so retention of data of everyone without a specification of the of group of people, of certain of about specification of the data that should be retained and without specifying a certain threat to society which, which would trigger retention, well, that general blanket retention is not proportional. That's basically what the court said. And what that exactly means, a lot of discussion is taking place, because the question is, does that mean that blanket retention as such, as part of this, of this data transfer directive, is never possible? Uh, scholars are divided on that. I argued at a certain moment that it's not possible because if you look at the data retention directive, its purpose is exactly uh, what is now stru stru struck down by the court. Namely, this directive uh, imp uh, imposes an obligation to, uh, an obligation to uh, store data, historical data of all citizens so that afterwards when a crime is committed or when there's a specific threat to security, you can trace back to whom people uh, in the past had communicated. So if you find someone a suspect at a certain moment, a sp person you didn't know in advance, you should know with whom he had communicated in advance to, in order to discover networks of people. That's exactly the purpose of the directive and that's exactly where the court says no. Uh, so there, may, there is an argument to make that it's very difficult to repair this and that alternative measures could be taken, like a thing which is always mentioned in this context is so-called yeah, quick freeze plus. It's a, it's a kind of a special, it's a measure that you only freeze data when the moment there is a crime, you freeze data you have, but you don't ask them to, re, to be uh, retained before. It's an, a proposal made by Casper Bowden quite often that doesn't work. Um, so, this is the big question. Is it possible to repair it? Uh, the second point, the, uh, which is important in this judgment, is that it clearly states, and that's also for all future EU legislation, extremely important in this area, that where EU law imposes an intrusion on fundamental rights, so where it imposes, for instance, here the storage of data, EU law, the same instrument, should also provide for the necessary safeguards. And that's important because what the legislator had done, and I will round off because I don't have much more time, uh, what the legislator had done, it said, we decide on the intrusion and the exact measures how to, uh, how the safeguards, who has access, under what conditions, uh, limiting access, uh, rights to for data subject, that's a matter, that's an issue for the national legislator. The court said clearly, if you ask for intrusion, intrusion then you must also ensure that there's <coughs> sufficient safeguards. Um, those are the main elements, I would say, of this court judgment. There's much more to say to it, but uh, that's not uh, what I'm allowed to say here. But I think it's good to keep in mind when we talk about it much longer, the main thing that uh, we are now back in a situation we all know where terrorist threats are uh, here, are there on a day-to-day -day basis, but when there's measures proposed to address those, emergency measures proposed to address those uh, threats, we now have a clear and strict legal framework to stick with. I think that's the main uh, value for the current situation of this directive. That's what I want to say. Thank you very much, Hilke. I know that was a, a difficult exercise to summarize such a huge and so debated disc decision in a very limited period of time. So would you say that's more a question of retention as such, the issue, or that's the fact that's an indifferentiated retention? Well, there's different issues. There is this, this measure was an, did a differentiate amongst people. You could say that other measures uh, are of a different nature. There's a lot of talk again about EU PNR, uh, a subject which is also on the table for 10 years almost, but was never adopted because of the, uh, the uh, problems with, with fundamental rights with privacy. It's now on the table again. Uh, 
I'm sure that the argument will be made by the legislator that is, this is not indiscriminate retention because it's only about those people who actually take a flight in and out of Europe. Uh, I'm not sure that that really makes the full difference, but it, it will, take, will make some difference, I'm sure. Yeah. Thank you. Fulco, I give you the floor. Okay, thank you, Sylvian. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, thank you Jens for my introduction. Uh, due to the time, I, I will not repeat that in short. Um, I represent uh, several uh, institutions and companies who uh, have started an interim in injunction proceedings against the Dutch state to suspend the Dutch Data Retention Act. Uh, I will um, tell you in short um, what the arguments are. Um, I will not go into depth about the uh, court decision. Um, uh, Hielke has uh, already uh, sketched some of those uh, criteria. Um, I will just elaborate on the Dutch situation. Uh, in the Netherlands, we, um, uh, formal legislation cannot uh, be uh, uh, assessed against the uh, constitution. Um, um, that's forbidden, but we can uh, assess it with a, a European uh, framework. Um, and therefore, it's important that, um, uh, except for, uh, apart from the fact that the court has declared 7-8 uh, of the charter uh, applicable in this case, uh, it's also very important that the uh, European um, Court of Human Rights case law um, is applicable. Um, I, I think that's also a little bit, um, it, it can have more attention than uh, it, it has been given uh, in, in, in the recent um, debates. Um, so what happened in the Netherlands after the, uh, the court decision? In April last year, we had uh, two major uh, ECG uh, court decisions, um, one of which was this. The other one was the uh, ACE um, in Dutch, Thuiskopie um, court decision, which was about uh, downloading from an illegal source. Um, after one week after that court decision, um, the, the um, uh, Minister of Security and Justice said, well, downloading from an illegal source is uh, Im uh, immediately forbidden in the Netherlands uh, within one week. Um, but it took the Dutch state uh, a couple of months to um, study the other court decision uh, of the Dutch, uh, of the Digital Rights Island, um, and it asked the Council of State, uh, it's an advisory division in the Netherlands, um, for advice how to um, handle this, this decision. Um, and the Council of State then um, stated, well, the uh, Dutch Data Retention Act largely mirrors um, the uh, directive, um, so uh, it is eminent that the act will uh, suffer the same fate as the directive. Um, it has to, um, uh, we have to adapt uh, to it. Um, the act falls within the scope of uh, Article 15 uh, of the e-privacy directive, that's the uh, legal framework where uh, um, it, it criteria of necessity are uh, um, uh, are stated, um, and at this, su at this situation, the, uh, at the current situation, the Dutch Act is still valid. So, telecom com communication companies, uh, ISPs, um, they still have to um, retain all the data um, as it, it was, was like 7 April 2014, um, and we still have a blanket retention for all uh, citizens, um, whether they are suspect or not suspect uh, in the Netherlands. Um, the Dutch government agreed with the Council of State and said, okay, we need to uh, uh, comply with the Article 15, we need to uh, uh, adapt it. We, um, th three months later after the advice, so in, in November, we, they proposed a new act in which they addressed uh, some, not all, of the criteria of the, the court decision. Um, for instance, they um, proposed uh, 
that access will now be uh, um, controlled by uh, by a judge. You have to pass uh, a judge to see the access. Um, but we still have blanket retention for 12 months and six months for all civilians. That has uh, will not change. Um, and that is uh, elaborated with the sentence, uh, we do not know beforehand who will be a suspect or who will not be a, a suspect. Um, and then they refused to suspend the act. Um, that's when we um, um, got some calls and um, got some uh, groups together and uh, formed a coalition. Uh, I will got, come to that uh, in, in the next slide. Uh, but it's important to note that the uh, European Parliament's legal service uh, has come more or less to the same conclusion uh, in December 2014 um, with uh, one of the quotes uh, following the DR ju DRI judgment, member states run, ever, run a, an, an even higher risk than before of having their legislation annulled by national courts. Um, so obviously we were pleased to read that. Um, so. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the, uh, the claimants we represent. Um, we have, uh, they're divided in three groups. Um, first of all, obviously, the groups who uh, protect privacy um, and human rights, uh, which are uh, privacy first and uh, uh, the NJCM, they're uh, an institution for uh, human rights in general. Um, then uh, a couple of um, internet and telecommunication server providers. Um, we regret that there weren't more. Maybe uh, they will join us or uh, um, join the court uh, on a later state and later date. Um, and last but not least, and this is also addressed in the DRR judgment, um, lawyers and journalists uh, that are the parties who have a right to professional secrecy. Um, and this is important, um, for instance, for, uh, for journalists because um, uh, the Netherlands um, has, the Dutch state uh, for that case, has um, received three times a verdict of the Euro European Court of Human Rights that they do not protect the uh, right to uh, secrecy of the sources of journalists um, in general. And now we have a, a new legislation coming up. Um, it has a lot of uh, criticism. Um, and we have uh, some very um, nasty examples of journalists who have been followed, who have been detained because they wouldn't give up their sources. So uh, um, it's important uh, to our opinion that in the new legislation um, some safeguards for these groups um, uh, will be handled as well. Um, Last bit, the court hearing is planned on 18 uh, February, so uh, still a month ahead. So um, um, maybe I'll see you there. Thank you, Fulke. How would you describe the, the position of telecommunication provider? Because they, they somehow they could be trapped in the middle, they, could they be sued by some citizen because they retain data without or based on an illegal basis, or are there an interest to go against the, the government, or would they more stay in the wood and just look at what's going on? Could you say a few words about that? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, they're in, in, in between the fires. Um, to me, it's quite obvious that they're breaching privacy rights um, by retaining the data, but on the other hand, they're risking severe fines, fines um, if they will not. Um, I guess if um, they, they have obviously a very good argument why they should stop or, or uh, retaining data at this moment, because uh, they're then now upholding a law that's, to our opinion, clearly unlawful, clearly unvalid. Um, so. Um, I think the risk will be um, minimized if it comes to court and they have, uh, they have a good case uh, where they have to stop uh, retaining the data. Um, the problem is, however, that um, until now, uh, yeah, there have been some people calling up to uh, uh, telecom communication companies, uh, please stop retaining data, but um, I have no example of one doing that. Maybe Reo Zenger will be... Uh, I have a bit more information about that later on. Thank you.
Fanny, yours is yeah. the green one. Right. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, in this short presentation, I'm not going to talk about the judgment itself, but um, I will talk about the domestic implications and uh, service providers in this regard. I will use Sweden and Hungary as an example. Um, not that Hungary has set uh, fundamental rights standards very high recently, but uh, anyway, it was a fun procedure, to, so I would like to share it with, with you. Um, after the ruling, we all know that domestic laws remained effective, and uh, it's interesting to see where does this leave us with whether they are compliant with the requirements of the court and whether they are compliant with domestic constitutional requirements. I will focus on the latter. And, um, and uh, when, when we try to, to uh, address a human rights violation, we sometimes do tactical mapping. We are looking for the main actors and the points of intervention. At this point, we will assess that the EU is not important because, of course, we know that the solution could come from there, but um, we haven't seen it yet. And uh, of course, maybe the most important actors here are constitutional courts, and you might uh, uh, are you might be familiar with the decisions that in many member states, such a, such as the Czech Republic or Romania, data data retention domestic laws were already repealed. And let's arrive to to our protagonist here, the internet and telephone service providers. When, when we were trying to assess how to, how to negotiate with them, we took into account that uh, they are in a very complex situation. Most of the cases, they are multinational companies and uh, the bench in the given member state might not be in the position to make a decision independently. We can't overlook the fact that they have political and business interests too. Um, Therefore, we found out that they almost, no, every, every service provider, at least in Hungary and in many other member states, they conclude strategic partnership agreements with the government. So it's kind of hard to convince them to then turn against a law. So the case of Hungary, it was pretty interesting how it happened. Uh, neither, neither of service providers decided to stop retaining data, but uh, after the judgment in April, there was no political will for uh, addressing this problem. We had national and then municipal elections, and ever since October, the politicians are too busy with the turmoil, with the demonstrations, Putin, and the new nuclear power plant in Hungary. So we can, we can say that the le legislation is off the table. The second actor could be the DPA. Well, the Hungarian DPA, um, you might remember that on the 8th of April, the exact date of the data retention ruling, there was another one calling, calling in question the independence of the Hungarian Data Protection Authority. Not so surprisingly, our authority remained silent in this problem, and they only gave a legal opinion when we asked for one. Then they said that they would support a change in legislation, but uh, there was no official initiation for that. The one, one, of the biggest, one of the biggest restrictions on fundamental rights in Hungary is uh, that the government uh, cut the access of every citizen to turn to the constitutional court. It's not possible anymore to challenge any law directly before the constitutional court. You have to go into a normal legal procedures before courts, which could take two to th three years, and only in the end you can challenge that decision. And this is what we chose to do. 
We were looking for partners between service providers. We have Telenor, Vodafone, and Telecom in Hungary. Telecom was out of the question because they have media ownership and they participated in uh, firing a chief editor of an online news site just because they published an article about a minister using public money for a private trip. And then he was fired the next week. So Telecom was out of the picture. We had Vodafone and Telenor. They said that uh, they uh, really hate this obligation to, to retain data, mostly because of the costs, of course, and maybe because of a very small uh, group of customers who appreciate uh, privacy and personal data. In the negotiations, it went the farthest with Telenor, who said they would support our case to challenge the law. But uh, a, new, a new public uh, procurement uh, frequency tender was introduced, one of the biggest ones. So th this company also decided not to be a partner with us. Therefore, we d the only option we had to sue these service providers, lose at every instance of at court, and then in the end turned to the Constitutional Court. Nevertheless, we tried something new. We invoked a provision almost, almost never used by judges. On the first trial day, we convinced the judge to suspend the case and refer it to directly to the Constitutional Court. It has never happened before in Hungary, only, only in cases regarding uh, Swiss Fran mortgages, and uh, we are very proud of this. And uh, now it's on the table of the Constitutional Court and they have 90 days to make a decision. In the meantime, we are not expecting much from this. But f we received an offer from an from a ISP that they will secretly involve our comments if a new law, uh, a new bill is introduced. But we can't put our name on it because as soon as our name as a human rights watchdog NGO gets on the paper, we can be sure that it won't be taken into account. So now the question is lobbying, secret lobbying, which is not our favorite thing, as I'm, I'm responsible for freedom of information as well, not just data protection. So the question is which will be more successful. And uh, a pretty different story from a pretty different country, just in, in a few words. In Sweden, after the ruling, service providers on their own initiative, they decided to stop retaining data. And everything went fine. They asked for the permission of the authority and uh, they were in, in agreement. And then in the summer, the government appointed a new commissioner and ordered the authority to, to call for the service providers to start retaining data again. And this is what happened, but without fines. At least so far, there was no fines. Uh, service providers de uh, decided to act differently. One of them did not uh, um, follow the order and still not retaining data. And they fight this legally, and they turned to the European Commission. The others, they were more covered, I guess, and uh, they followed the order. Yeah, um, well, my conclusion is just a remark that isn't that ironic that service providers who are not really our big, we don't really like them from a data protection uh, perspective, Th these, these companies are our biggest allies in this fight. Thank you, Fanny. When, I, when you presented the, the situation in Hungary, I, I had some concern because the, the telco have interest at least not to, to react, or most of them. The, the citizens, we do not really know how far they care or how, how ready they are just to, to defend the, the right. Then you, you presented the, the situation in another country when we see a little more hope, but not that much. So. Is that just a subject that we hate discussing and that privacy lawyers are very keen to, to discuss and see an interest? Or is that something that's more important and we need to fight or people are ready to fight for? 
Well, about the interest, um, the, uh, the most important arguments of service providers, the maximum what we could get, that when we tried to turn to the constitutional court, they claimed that they're not objecting to it. So they didn't say that they support this. They said, okay, we are not in objection. But the main concern was not about um, fundamental rights. The main concern was uh, cl claims for damages. They are scared that if the constitutional court says that it was unlawful data retention, that one, what happens if all customers will turn to court and sue for damages arising from the unlawful data retention. Uh, I, see, I see this is as the most, the most important interest. So that, that, that would be the leverage that you could have regarding telco. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. So um, my name is Francisca Boom. I'm from the University of Münster and we conducted a study uh, for the Greens in the Parliament um, on the data retention case and it's a quite comprehensive study so it's almost 100 or a bit more than 100 pages. Um, the study analysis um, the data retention directive judgment um, of the court in uh, detail and uh, we evaluated uh, the impact on other data retention measures in member states and as well um, at, uh, at EU level. We analyzed it from a EU point uh, or from EU law so it's a and it doesn't um, include national law, but uh, we try to um, analyze it from a EU law point of view. Um, the study was handed out yesterday at the reception of the Polish Embassy. If you went there, you could have received uh, a copy. <laughs> so, um, I will briefly summarize um, this study and um, what we did. So basically, we analyzed uh, three points. Um, First, we analyzed the main principles of the data retention judgment, so what can be deducted from, uh, from the case and what is important if, you, if um, member states or the EU plan to introduce new data retention measures. Um, then we analyzed a bit the impact on data retention measures in the member states, so what can member states do if um, they, member states or NGOs can do um, if member states still have uh, their data retention laws in place. And finally, um, we um, evaluated the impact on other data retention measures in, in the EU. Um, the first thing, so I come to the results uh, of the study and the results of the analysis of the data retention uh, judgment. I think it is very astonishing um, that is the complete and um, retrospective annulment of the data retention directive. Yeah. It's one of the first times that the court really annulled a whole directive and completely declared it void. So um, this is important and it emphasizes the seriousness of violation of uh, fundamental rights. Um, we also believe that it is a clear opposition uh, to the general and undifferentiated nature of mass data retention measures, which is also the first time that the Court of Justice um, clearly said something to this issue. And the court, which is good from a legal point of view, it really linked um, the European Convention of Human Rights with the European Charter of Human Rights and uh, fundamental rights, and this allows us to interpret um, the cases which, which we have with regard to Article 8 of the European Convention of Human Rights uh, to the interpretation of Article 7 and 8 of the Charter, um, which is very important because we didn't have a case before where the European Court of Justice really linked the two legal orders um, in privacy-related issues. So from, a point, from our point of view, this is a good um, way. This also, um, we concluded that this um, interpretation of the ECHR and the CFR in a parallel way allows uh, for a broad application of the principles developed in the case. The court did not limit it its um, jurisdiction to this specific case of the data retention directive. Um, it applied broad principles and these uh, principles need to be um, respected when other data retention measures uh, should be uh, in uh, place. 
Yeah, so by referring uh, to the guarantees of the European Convention of Human Rights, um, the court clearly links um, the two legal orders and even closer than in the past and uh, this opens the possibility to interpret also the case law of the European Court of uh, Human Rights in parallel with the um, case law of the European Court of Justice. Um, the principles you can uh, derive from, from the judgments, I think we already heard a bit, but I will repeat it. <laughs> um, important is that there are separate infringements of Article 7 and 8, you know, the collection, retention and transfer of data. And these separate infringements need to be um, yeah, separated or justified in a separate way, which is important from a legal point of view. You can't just, um, if you collect data, you need to justify. If you retain data, you need a justification. Even if you transfer data, you need a separate justification for this transfer. And this is um, important if you um, retain or if you plan to retain uh, data. I think it's also clear that the court rejects blanket data retention of unsuspicious persons um, in a very clear way. Um, we also have a no, or it opposed the indefinite and uh, lengthy retention period, so this is also very um, very important, and the most important thing is that link, the court requires a link between a threat to public security and the data retained, uh, retained for law enforcement purposes. And um, so the court sees a sensitive problem in data originally collected for other than law enforcement purposes and later used for law enforcement purposes. And if a new data retention measures are to be um, proposed, this link um, should be respected. So law enforcement access is only allowed to data collected for other purposes in specific cases. And um, the court required effective procedural rules such as independent oversight and access control. And this was something which was not yet clear because we didn't have a judgment, have a judgment on this issue uh, so far from the European Court of Justice. Um, because the court also linked the two legal orders and referred to the Marpa case in um, yeah, more, than one more than once uh, in the judgment, it also means that the court is aware of the risk of stigmatization um, which comes from the inclusion of data in law enforcement databases and this risk of stigmatization um, also needs to be considered when, um, when enacting new or possible new data retention uh, measures. When we come to the impact on data retention measures in, in the member states, um, it shows that National um, data retention measures transposing the data retention directive need to be amended if they contain provisions which are close to those of the now void data retention directive. And there is a close a link between the standards of the charter and um, the member states' measures in this uh, field, um, which also leads to an equivalent standard for the validity test of the transposing law. Yeah. So if governments and parliaments um, do not change their national data retention systems or adapt them to the principles developed by the court, um, there are ways to challenge um, court or laws before the courts, um, as you already <laughs> said, um, and this would likely lead to similar consequences for the national laws um, as the Court of Justice drew for the uh, data retention uh, directive. And the second option um, is uh, to an, enact another preliminary reference based on Article 15 of the e-privacy directive because we still have um, the opportunity to um, retain data based on this article and there is a possibility to go again um, for before the court or before the uh, European Court of Human Rights. Um, briefly uh, to the impact on other data retention measures so you know it's a big uh, study, so we analyzed um, a lot of um, measures. Um, I think the results of the analyst, analysis of the impact of other data retention measures in the member states um, and at EU level show that, so we analyzed EU, US PNR, and the EU PNR proposal, and the TFTP agreement, so this is the SWIFT agreement, and a plan to establish the same in, at EU level, plus the access to Eurodac 
and um, the ex entry access uh, proposal. And all these measures, all these analyzed measures provide for data retention and affect also an enormous amount of unsuspicious individuals, even if they are only individuals taking one flight, as Hilke <laughs> said. Um, and some of the measures seems to be even uh, more infringing than the original data retention uh, directive. And some of these measures uh, have fundamental compatibil compatibility problems, in particular when it comes to undifferentiated bulk data collection and the transfer of, for example, flight passenger data um, to the US. And the same problems arise with regard to respective plans to establish a system at EU level. So these measures show some shortcomings when it comes to the compliance with the fundamental rights principles which were developed by the court in the data retention uh, judgment and we concluded um, uh, that it is essential that the blanket data retention of unsuspicious persons for the later use for law enforcement is not in line with Article 7 and 8 and uh, member states as well as the, as the EU need to adapt their measures to these uh, principles. Finally, um, what happens now, I mean, we have Paris, so uh, we have the discussion about a new data retention uh, directive, we have the discussion about EU PNR, um, I, I would say that we should um, evaluate the existing um, instruments before asking for new ones. Um, we should deeply analyze these uh, instruments, um, not only from a practical way, but also from a theoretical way. So. Um, check whether they fulfill the requirements of the European Court of Justice. We can't just ignore this judgment. And um, one thing, I'm not so sure about it, but we don't um, have an, uh, one instrument which deals with the access of law enforcement to private sector data. I'm now playing a bit the devil's advocate. Maybe do we need a kind of um, instrument that regulates um, these access, um, which we currently have in different uh, systems, um, then we would clearly need to stay within the limits of the Court of Justice um, case and respect that um, we need to establish uh, the link between a threat to public security and uh, data retained. So, um, thank you. This was mine. <laughs> Thank you, Francesca. You, you mentioned that the, the court decision refers to the, the European Convention of Human Rights, and that do not happen very often. Then a country is willing to, to uh, a court is willing to mention the, the case law for a foreign country because there is a lot of reason the U.S. considers no other law than the U.S. or European country are afraid to lose some, some control. So. What, what was the reason for, for the court to do that? Was that uh, if there was no fear to lose some, some control by referring more to the Carta, or was there a need from the, the ECG, ECG to have some help, let's say, from the European Convention? Um, I think that well, we all know that the ECJ didn't have the um, opportunity to deal with these kind of issues of the former third pillar before, so it was one of the first judgments which dealt with these issues. And we also know that the European um, Court of Human Rights has a long and established history of uh, judgments in, in this respect. So I think that the court wanted to make clear that um, we have established standards in Europe and by linking the standards of the EU to the standards of the ECHR, um, it, I think it wanted to emphasize the importance of the standards which were already developed by, by the European Court of Human Rights, um, which is a good thing, I believe. Thank you. Here we are. So, thank you for uh, having me here. I'm Rayo Zenger. I'm from the Dutch Digital Civil Rights Organization, Bits of Freedom. Um, I would suggest to, well, let's save the European Commission uh, some work. 
Uh, and I would like to do so by sharing two examples of the justifying of the necessity of data retention legislation in the Netherlands. The Dutch still have the legislation and providers are required to store traffic data uh, up to one year. So let me sh uh, show you the first example. Um, this is the cover of a report that most of you will probably know. It's the report from the European Commission to the European Parliament, and it's, on the, it's the evaluation report on the data retention directive. It was published in 2011. It's a report that, according to the Commission, proved that the directive is an essential tool in combating crime in the European Union. However, I think it forgot to include the facts to build to that conclusion. The report was based on the input of member states. So the Netherlands was one of the first countries to come up with some data. The Commission writes, the Netherlands reported that from January to July 2010, historical traffic data was a decisive factor in 24 court judgments. But even before the report was published, uh, I already had made a FOIA request for that Dutch input and then uh, analyzed those, uh, those verdicts. And as it turns out, five of those uh, verdicts are all on one and the same case. Uh, another thing is that 22 of those uh, verdicts are in cases where the investigation of the Dutch police and prosecutor were done before the data retention uh, law became into force. And in one case even the court decided against the use of data retention data. So then there's another uh, example. In 2012, Vodafone was hit by a large fire uh, that destroyed an entire building of a regional telephone exchange in Rotterdam. Uh, approximately a quarter of uh, Vodafone's national network was destroyed or severely damaged, so people couldn't call like in for a couple of days. And let me show you a plan of that building that, got, that was destroyed. A depicts the location of the data retention database. B is uh, where the backup of that database was stored. Of course, the National Regula Regulatory Authority started an investigation, and one of the key findings was during the investigation, uh, it became clear that the database for the traffic data and the backup of them were in the same room. Um, so it was completely destroyed, and Vodafone explained the law did require us to have backup, but it didn't require us to have it in a separate location. Anyways, you would expect this to be a problem uh, to the police if all the data retention data is uh, suddenly gone, right? But the report goes on. With a temporary workaround, Vodafone could provide a limited set of location information over a period of six months prior to the incident. That's odd. But, limited, but, a limited set in, um, in, uh, but a limited set of data and limited in time that should pose a problem to the police, I would say. Then the NRA goes on and it writes, inquiries with the police and the public prosecutor has made clear that this has yielded no major problems with them. Then, then there's this other thing. Just in case the data may not be retained long enough uh, for the investigation of the police, we have some quick freeze provision in law. So the Dutch criminal code allows the prosecutor to order uh, the data is retained for a period of up to 90 days and kept available. If this period is too short, then they can extend the uh, period for even uh, another 90 days. So that leads to two conclusions for me. Uh, one is the Dutch government never, was never able to prove the necessity of our data retention law. And I even think it's safe to say that the Dutch government never even investigated the necessity of the data retention law in the first place. So here's my proposal. Now let's ask this man, Commissioner Aframopoulos. Um, he's the commissioner uh, for, the, uh, for, uh, DG, for Home Affairs. And we need to ask him whether he really, really needs another data retention directive. Thank you. That was within eight minutes, right? <laughs> In four minutes. <laughs> Thank you. So could you maybe say a few more words about yeah. this freezing provision, the quick freeze provision? Um, well, I'm not sure <laughs> what I should tell, <laughs> tell you about it. So the thing is, there is this provision in law, but we don't know how often uh, that provision is used. So we, we do not know whether uh, the police is actually aware of the provision. We don't know how often they are using it. Um, and it shows that, again, the um, Dutch government didn't really investigate whether we actually need a data retention law. And I think that 
uh, in the Netherlands, we still have this law. That should be abolished as well. And thanks to Fulco, we will, uh, I hope that will happen. And then um, uh, it's important that um, we, at the U European level, we will make sure that there will be no new directive because otherwise our efforts will be in vain. Thank you. So one question to, to all of you, very briefly, and then we can turn to, to the audience uh, because I'm sure that you, you all have some, some questions. If you don't, I, I have a list, so don't, don't worry about that. So first question for, for all of you. Would you say that there, there was something before, there is a before and after the, the decision of April 8, 2014, on if so, how, or more concretely, what does that change in your activities, in your field of research, before and after the decision? Well, if I look at this from my perspective as a researcher, which I am at the moment, it's helped me a lot to do my research because this gives a framework for uh, a clear and clear framework to judge or to uh, assess whether or not measures which are taken uh, to allow government access to data are stored in the private sector to have a clear yardstick, to have clear rules on what is possible and what is not possible. Of course, these rules are not so clear yet and I'm sure there will be a follow-up. I'm sure that there will be follow-up questions, especially <coughs> since many member states are continuing by uh, uh, also by data retention and also by the fact that uh, in, on EU level, even if the Commissioner Avramo Avramopoulos doesn't do anything, there will still there is still the whole whole discussion on EU PNR ongoing, and I think that discussion will have to be linked to what is uh, said by the court in data retention. Before I answer the question, I would like to make a quick comment about the evidence because we were sitting in Amsterdam in a summer university course and someone from the Interpol mentioned that even if we ask in freedom of information requests about the statistics, whether it's efficient or not to access these data, it will never be answered because, because if they did answer the freedom of information request, it might undermine the assumption that it's effective. You know what this means. And the answer to your question, I believe that for us, yes, it was a definite before-after moment, but because of a special domestic problem. Um, of course, data retention is not new, and we issued several um, complaints to the Constitutional Court before, but they were allowed to throw them away due to a change in 2011. And this uh, ruling of the court created a new possibility to fight it. So for us, the answer is yes. But I, th I believe that uh, the Paris attacks might be a new wall of before, after. Second after. Um, I, th I think before it wasn't clear, and this is from a scholar's point of view, um, how we link the ECHR cases to the European Union cases. And I think this is <coughs> tremendously important that the European Court of um, Justice linked the two legal orders in this very important um, issue of privacy and data protection. Um, when it comes to the after, I think that we will have new cases. If you, you think about the Schrems case, which will come, um, I think also we need to develop um, clear rules on access of law enforcement to private sector data. We don't have any rules on that. We have some yardsticks, as Hilke said, but we need to go further. And I think we need to make sure that the court, the judgment is uh, respected and heard. In, in the development of new data retention rules, and this is the most important thing we can learn. The court made a first step, other judgments will come, and um, yeah, let's make sure that the judgment is respected. That's the most important thing. So, um, I think there uh, is um, uh, a after now because we have an additional tool in fighting such legislation and proposals for so. 
But then again, there is no before and after if we would allow uh, the European Commission to uh, create another directive uh, uh, with data retention. And the same goes for the Netherlands. If we are not able to, um, uh, to annul the Dutch law, then there is no real before and after because we will end up uh, retaining the data retention law. So I think there is a, uh, a after, but we definitely need to do some work on that. Well, it, it's a, the, the big question is, is uh, where this leads, I, I suppose. I, I think it's clear from the political um, environment right now and what we're hearing that, that governments are absolutely adamant that these uh, kinds of practices need to continue and, uh, you know, if not, if not be expanded. And, and I, think, I think people who uh, worry about this need to think about whether the <laughs> whether this needs to be fought on a country by country basis or whether they, there is uh, uh, whether there's potential in an in an EU track and a a piece of of legislation that sets strict limits around this i, I think uh, i think we'll have to i think there's much more discussion to be had around this um, um, so very interesting times I suspect there are some microphones somewhere in the room. Is someone? No? Okay, so I will give you mine. So if someone has a question, so please introduce yourself and mention if you want someone in particular to, to answer your question. So that's always the, the first question that's, that's carrying and that's caused. So we want to be first. Oh, you don't have, okay, so. <laughs> this, this. Yep, sorry. <laughs> Hi, my name is Gustav Mollis. I'm, I'm a PhD student from the University of Rennes 1 in France and the Institute of Technological Research, Beacon. I have a question foremost to Hilke Himans, Mr. Hilke Himans, uh, but to the rest of the panel as well. Uh, you specify that you don't think that the European Commission will adopt another directive on data retention, as I might have misunderstood you there. But what is your opinion on the future like development? Because as I understand it, the judgment doesn't say, the European Court of Justice doesn't dispute the um, principle of data retention itself, because there's a general interest. It doesn't dispute the effectiveness also. It, it, it merely states that, it, that the current directive is disproportionate in relation to the objective sought. It specifies that the, ret the retention period is disproportionate in relation to the purposes sought, but it doesn't specify that the retention period between six months and two years is disproportionate in itself. It also disputes that the access to the contents on a national level or the access to the information is too easy, but it doesn't dispute the fact that there are a necessity or a potential gain in data retention. So what is your opinion and the panel's opinion on the development? Might there still be a directive because the principle of data retention in itself is not discarded by the European Court of Justice? Secondly, concerning other data retention acts, such as the PNR agreement with the United States. Um, the European Court also made quite a point of pointing out that one of the reasons for the invalidation of the directive was that the information was not stored inside the European Union in relation to that geographical location. So in relation to that sort of point of invalidation, how do you see the PNR agreement and other such agreements of inform when information effectively is being transferred outside of the borders of the European Union? So, two parts on the questions. <coughs> I can start. I'm sure that others have views on this as well. Uh, let's start about whether or not a new directive. To be honest, I'm not fully in agreement with uh, Rayo that, we, that a new directive would as such be a bad thing. It makes sense, possibly, if you have clear rules, clear, clear safeguards to put to lay them down on a European level instead that instead of every country making its own considerations, which might be in the end also from the perspective of human rights protection, not the best lead to the best result. That's one point. The other point is about the judgment itself. Uh, you were quite clear in your evaluation of the judgment. Um, I 
in my view, the judgment goes further than you say. It's not only uh, putting limits to retention as such, but you can you can really question whether or not retention on a blanket on a on this blanket on this on this huge scale as such is still possible because if you look at the considerations of the court it puts so clear it's so clear on this huge uh, retention on this wide retention without any limits that you can ask yourself whether such a retention as such is still possible uh, so that's more i think than than what you you say uh, of course there's a lot of things to say about it. It's all about proportionality, and of course, uh, uh, if you limit the time, if you do other things, you could still do things, but... Okay, uh, I will be short. Um, so I'm not fully convinced that it's only uh, this specific directive with this touch and that you can easily replace it. But there are, I'm sure that there are methods to replace it. The last point, that's the most difficult point, which you didn't touch at all in this in this panel, is the somehow remarkable uh, consideration of the court in, in the end of its judgment, where it says that data should be stored within the European Union. At least that's an, that's an important factor. That it's um, it's difficult to say what what that will mean in all times. But I don't think it, it's a, it's a it's a consideration which makes it worse, let's say, the fact that there's no control by European data protection authorities. But I don't think that the court really meant to say that in all cases data should be stored within the European Union. Uh, that's quite a far-going thing if you think how the Internet works at this moment. And I think that's, that's difficult to, to imagine. I also think that it does not mean that US PNR, provided that there are clear limits on how the United States deals with this data, that US PNR uh, is invalid for the mere reason that storage takes place outside of the European Union. I would, but I would give others places. There is another question in the, in the middle, if you could give the microphone. Oh, sorry. Want to the question? Um, uh, yeah, maybe two things. The first thing is that unfortunately the EU has no competence to deal with the national security services so far, so this is um, still something which is not really in the competence, but I can imagine that the court, um, because the principles were very broad, uh, and I think that the court wanted to um, start a debate on this. Um, because having in mind what happened w um, with uh, Snowden. Um, but it, it, I think for the EU it's very difficult to develop rules um, with regard to the national se um, security services. I, I wish it would have the, conf um, the competence, but they don't have it. But um, the principles the court developed are at least so far reaching that we, at least scholars can try to apply them um, to a different field, which also concerns national security services. <laughs> in my point of view, um, when national security try to access this information, it creates even more 
uh, risk in terms of informational self-determination and it's less transparent. So in my point of view, if you say that even the excess of law enforcement is uh, too much and therefore the, the directive was invalid, then I believe that it has a direct effect, at least domestically, that, uh, that national security has to, has to, uh, uh, to uh, accept the same safeguards or even more. But it's not going to happen, at least not in Hungary for sure. I, I'm aware of the, yeah, of the laws. Hi, uh, Edward Hasbrook, papersplease.org. I think there's some misunderstanding in the discussion uh, of the PNR issue of where the data reside, both in terms of commercial versus government and in terms of place. Um, PNR data is retained by industry not pursuant to the data retention directive, but they were already retaining this data for extended periods of time for their own commercial purposes. So the discussion about government access is only about the mirror copies that the government makes after it obtains them. The data already existed and still existed in those commercial databases. The second point I'd make is, in terms of the transfer, the agreement with the US only covers transfers to the US government. It has no effect on the commercial transfers which already occur at earlier stages when European airlines, tour operators, travel agencies have their PNR, their commercial PNR databases hosted in the US as many of them do. So those commercial transfers are not covered by the PNR agreement with the US about transfers to the US government. They're governed by safe harbor. Now, I would argue that almost all of the transfers, the outsourcing to US reservation systems of commercial PNR data violate safe harbor. And that's a safe harbor enforcement problem, completely independent, and which is still a violation even with the US EU PNR agreement. I think I agree with, with, all, you say, <coughs> with all you say. Uh, however, it's good, and I think it's also extremely important to distinguish clearly the commercial flow of information of, of, of uh, passenger data from what's required under PNR. Re PNR, what PNR does, it requires European companies to send those data to, to the US government. And why is this a problem from the perspective of EU data protection law? Because it infringes the principle of purpose limitation. You uh, give this data for a simple purpose, namely you want to travel, so you need to, your airline needs to have this information, and you don't give it in order to have a government uh, have a policy or imply, uh, uh, implement its policy on national security or on law enforcement. That, that makes a difference. It's, it's indeed two totally different issues. Um, about what happens with uh, under safe harbor, I will, I will not go into, but I think the PNR agreement as such is on this requirement to, to send data to the US government. And here, I think the, the uh, elements put in the data retention case can be very helpful to evaluate whether or not this is allowed. Uh, but that does not give a final answer to it to if it's allowed or not, but it's, it gives help. Can I briefly add that it's, uh, I think it is comparable because I mean, um, for the, uh, the data of the telecommunications providers are also stored on a, for commercial purposes at telecommunication um, providers. So it, this is similar to the PNR case and uh, sure, the, what you said is completely true. So and then there's one more thing, like in, uh, Edward was saying that PNR data is already um, stored uh, by commercial organizations uh, even without an agreement uh, for, uh, by a government, for a government copy for that. 
And the same thing happens with the data retention in the Netherlands. So when I was saying that the Dutch government should investigate whether uh, data retention is actually needed because maybe the data is already available, um, there's this report for, from the uh, Dutch uh, NRA that says that uh, from the investigated uh, uh, providers, 75% of them doesn't delete the data at the end of the retention period, but they re retain it for even longer. And those companies have um, sometimes uh, legitimate reasons for that, like in they, have, they need it for billing purposes or for other reasons, or they have the, um, the consent from the consumer. But in other cases, uh, that also happens, like in I think a quarter of those companies uh, retains the data um, for no legitimate reason. But the thing is, the data is already available, so you don't, I, d I don't think you need a law in requiring the companies to even retain them longer. So one last question from the audience. Yes, uh, it's not really a question, but I think I have some uh, relevant information to share with uh, all of you coming from uh, Cyprus. Um, first of all, in uh, Cyprus, uh, there is no way that uh, the law, national law that transposed the data retention directive will be found unconstitutional. And the reason is that in 2010, we have amended our constitution to bring it in line with the, the data retention directive. So the only hope uh, is uh, for that data retention law in Cyprus to be found uh, against um, EU law, which is something very possible given the recent uh, decision of uh, the um, uh, ECJ. Um, we already have uh, a Supreme Court judgment uh, in uh, July 2014 only for uh, three months after the CJ decision. And the uh, Cyprus Supreme Court said that data retention law, the Cypriot law, is fully effective as part of uh, the Cypriot uh, uh, national law. It made no reference to the fact that uh, it should be amended, even though the lawyers brought to the court's attention the recent decision of the ECJ. And the most interesting things, thing is that there is um, um, a case, a legal action filed before the European Court of Human Rights against this decision, and uh, I'm one of the lawyers. So we may have uh, a European a, a court decision by the European Court uh, by the European Court of Human Rights um, discussing uh, the, the impact of the annulment of the data retention directive uh, on um, uh, national data retention uh, laws. Uh, just to add something uh, that is relevant, I think, um, I think one way is for the service providers to stop retaining data, and uh, they will be imposed a fine. Uh, they will not pay the fine, and they will, be, they will face legal action, and then they will have this opportunity to challenge the legality of this obligation. Uh, one way I agree is uh, with a preliminary reference ruling, and because Article 15 also has a proportional test, it will be very difficult to pass that, that test, given that the, court, the European Court said that the law doesn't uh, meet the proportionality test. Uh, and uh, regarding damages, uh, I think Fanny was um, mentioned about uh, service providers fearing about having to pay damages. Uh, I think that uh, it will be a defense that at the time uh, they were under a legal obligation. And in any event, uh, individuals that uh, are going to sue service providers will have to prove damage. And if they cannot prove damage, um, at least under Cyprus law, uh, they will only be awarded nominal damages, which is not something to worry about uh, service providers. Thank, Thank you for you. that comment. So as a conclusion, we had Ilke explaining, interpreting the decision. We had Fulco telling us about that Dutch court case. Fanny mentioning the difficulties to have some, some support. Francesca presenting this comprehensive research on the, the impact of other programs. And we had Rewa that was 
asking some very interesting questions of the efficiency of those retained data. As a conclusion to, for you all, very briefly, let's say Twitter style, 130 characters, what is your takeaway of that decision? Or if you have to give one sentence to, to the, the floor, what should they bring home? I think this is the real, uh, the one sentence for me will be, the Charter of Fundamental Rights now really became a yardstick, became got teeth by this judgment. Um, it's a very clear victory for privacy and for the uh, uh, European Court, uh, where privacy remarks have been um, uh, abolished in all legislation uh, for years. Um, uh, and this, this is really a landmark case for that reason. I am very disappointed in the judgment because of not applying uh, the efficiency test at all. But in the meantime, I'm happy, I'm happy that uh, domestically it, it, it created a possibility to gain success. Um, maybe a hope. <laughs> um, we, yeah, we need to make sure that the judgment is respected and also with regard to other data retention measures and I think this is a good uh, starting point uh, to discuss this. So I think I agree with the notion that it is a victory for uh, privacy, but I do think we still have a long road to go to fix all of those um, uh, uh, impact having laws. I agree with that, and I think there's a big job uh, in terms of uh, uh, expanding this debate beyond privacy advocates and, and jurists and experts and, and making this a, you know, surve the surveillance state, that needs to be a, a prime political issue, uh, uh, you know, a mainstream political issue in countries. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you for making that panel so interesting, and please give a big applause to my colleague.